I'd like to bring in uh, Greg Grandin, a uh, uh, historian of Latin American history. Uh, your reaction when you heard of this case and, and uh, the research that you've done in terms of Guatemalan migration in general? Yeah, I did a, I did a little research uh, in the past on the region where, where Jacqueline was from. And Kekchi, she was, she was Kekchi Maya, one of the major Mayan groups in Guatemala. And if you wanted to do a a history of 20th century displacement caused by political repression, caused by the expansion of capitalism, extractive capitalism, caused by one after another failed Washington policies. You could you could do no better than look at the history of the Kekchi Maya. They were in the end of the 19th century, early 1900s. They were tended to be grouped in the northern highlands in Guatemala. The coming of coffee capitalism, financed by by by. New York U.S. banks began pushing and basically stealing, dispossessing massive amounts of land, turning Kekchis into agricultural laborers, or then pushing them into the highlands, down into the lowlands, uh, not the highlands, the lowlands, so the Caribbean or to the to the rainforest where they settled new communities, and 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 there they 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 ran into, they got caught up in other forms of extractive capital, logging and oil, and now Af African palm. I mean, this is this is a region that. Is caught in the vortex of global capitalism, and, and a lot of the policies that we could talk about the drug policy, you Washington's war on drugs, which has devastated these communities. The emphasis on African palm biofuels, which have devastated these communities. And so, the history in the 20th century, up to the beginning of the 21st century, is an expansion of the radius of migration. And and she, you know, th these are now people who I mean, she was from a, a community that was recently created, a refugee community in the low. Lands that was that was fleeing from repression and violence from an earlier cycle of of extraction and and political terror and it's all caught up in the history that a lot of listeners of Democracy Now will know the overthrow of Jacobo Arbenz in 1954 in Guatemala CIA's full first full spectrum coup which had baleful consequences on any number of levels including leading to a 36 year civil war a genocide against Mayan Indians and the Kekchi her people her community bore an enormous amount of violence in that genocide so there's 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 ways in which her death this death of the 7 year old girl who just turned 7 a couple of years a couple of days before she crossed the United States kind of encapsulates this this history not of a humanitarian crisis that is largely caused by Washington, not that Washington has to respond to it in a better way. It's it's largely the it's largely caused by not just the and it's not just the Trump administration. This has deep, deep history in U.S. and U.S. relations with Central America. I'd like to turn to Homeland Security, Kirsten, uh, Secretary Kirsten Nielsen's comments about uh, Jacqueline's death. Uh, she was interviewed Friday on Fox and Friends. This is just a very sad example of the dangers of this journey. This family chose to cross illegally. Uh, what happened here was they were 90, about 90 miles away from where we could process them. Uh, they came in such a large crowd that it took our Border Patrol folks mm -hmm. a couple uh, times to get them all. Uh, we gave immediate care. We'll continue to look into the situation. But again, I cannot stress how dangerous this journey is when sure. migrants choose to come here illegally. So, and that's Kirsten Nielsen yeah. saying, and this is repeated over and over by the Trump administration, saying it's the families that are putting their children in danger yeah. by simply making this journey. Talk about the extremity of what these families yeah. face. Look, the Trump administration is vile, but um, this history predates the Trump administration. And my co-author of the piece that you mentioned, Liz Oglesby, has written a lot about this, um, uh, the way that, they, that since starting in the 1990s, pretty much concordant corresponding to the expand to the signing of NAFTA the Clinton administration Bill Clinton began to militarize the border making relatively safe urban passages shutting them down and forcing migrants into the desert this was intentional uh, a Clinton uh, official said we can use the we could use geography as an ally meaning we could use the torments of the desert in order as deterrence to keep migrants out it, that didn't happen. The, the desperation, largely caused by po economic policies like NAFTA, continued to force displace 
hundreds of thousands, millions of peasants off their land. They had nowhere to go. They came to the United States. And all the militarization of the border did was it raised the cost. It ended seasonal migration. It, ain't, it changed the nature of migration, because once you did make it into the United States, you were captured. You couldn't go back and forth. You had to stay here. So increasingly, the demographic profile of migration changed. You came with your whole family. You, 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 or you came rather than a, a worker would go work, come back, go, go and work. So, so in some ways, the military didn't, didn't stop migration. It actually created a captive, undocumented, vulnerable population of tens of millions of people in the United States that, um, that, that, uh, that is, is one aspect of this interlocking uh, set of, of policies that have just been catastrophic for North America. Uh, uh, Clara Long, I'd like to ask you, Human Rights Watch issued a report earlier this year talking about the uh, inhumane jail-like conditions that many of these, uh, especially the asylum seekers, the migrants who cross the border, the, or the asylum seekers are being put in. Could you, could you talk about what you would see as the, a, a better solution, given the, the significant numbers, the increases that have been occurring of migration? Uh, how would the government better be able to handle this, in your opinion? or should be able to handle this? Right. I mean, first, I would say, uh, you know, the government has thrown an enormous amount of resources at, at controlling and cracking down, uh, uh, militarizing, as Greg says, the border. Um, you know, that resource, those resources could be uh, better deployed. Uh, and, you know, I've been in uh, several of these border jails this year, even, and, um, you know, they are very cold, highly air-conditioned. Uh, children are kept in concrete cells with basically nothing to sleep on many times, uh, you know, inadequate access to clean water, uh, cold, uh, small, you know, small amounts of, of ramen, often food that people can't eat. Uh, and this, this sort of feeling that they can't ask for anything or they will be punished, you know, this, the, this, the abusive behavior by agents is widespread and systematic. Um, you know, I would add, also, y y you have large groups uh, like the one that Jacqueline crossed in that are uh, perhaps increasingly crossing between ports of entry exactly because they cannot get through ports of entry. You know, uh, under a policy started under the Obama administration of metering people who are going through ports of entry, we heard about that. You know, we've been hearing about this as, as, as Congress people are going down to, say, Tijuana to to, to um, you know, walk people across the border and ensure that CBP accepts them. That shouldn't be necessary. Uh, under U.S. law, there is a way uh, to go to the port of entry and turn yourself in and ask for asylum. But what the Trump administration has said across the entire border is that it won't accept more than, uh, you know, a couple people a day. And that's, re that's resulted in huge backlogs, which have caused people to cross, uh, again, in, you know, increasingly remote and harsh places. And there's a very um, serious question we... about whether this is even legal, what the Trump administration is doing. When Democracy Now! was down there on the border, we saw people um, that were there day after day after day. And uh, just in the last few days, uh, Congress members um, uh, Barragan and Gomez were on the border. They got Maria up with her family, the, who famously was tear gassed, holding her children the other day, uh, one of the Honduran immigrants, and they had to take her in and demand hour after hour. They were held for something like seven to nine hours before they could come in. I just want an interesting fact. The federal judge in the Washington, D.C. Uh, case, who just delayed the sentencing for Trump's former national security adviser, Michael Flynn, has played a major role in challenging President Trump's immigration policies. Uh, in August, District Judge Emmett Sullivan, who's African-American judge, who was first uh, named by Reagan, then George H.W. Bush, and then President Clinton, expressed outrage when he learned the Trump administration had used an airplane to spirit away a migrant El Salvadoran mother and her daughter, who were fleeing uh, persecution in El Salvador. Uh, the woman was uh, fleeing domestic violence there. Judge Sullivan ordered the government, turn that plane around, either now or when it lands, turn that plane around and bring those people back to the United States. It's outrageous, he said. He even threatened to bring criminal contempt proceedings against then-U.S. Attorney General Jeff Sessions if she wasn't returned. Um, Greg Grand and the opposition has been going on for a long time, but the significance of what's happening.
It's well. First, let me say the, the Border Patrol is the is 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 a rogue agency since its foundation in 1924. It's arguably, arguably the most politicized, most abusive agency. It never had anything equivalent that the CIA had in the 1970s with a Church Committee report or a Rockefeller Committee report looking at it, leading to some degree of reform. This is the front line of 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 some of the worst elements of U.S. culture: white supremacy, racism. It's had links to the KKK since its inception. There's a reporter, John Crudson, who wrote in the 1970s and 1980s of, of, of abuses in the Border Patrol that, that are as bad or worse than anything that we're reading about here. This is a long, long history that predates the Trump administration. So, on the one level, it's the, it's, it's, it's the enforcement, border enforcement, and, and the brutality and the way that that brutality and violence feeds into the, the, the nativism in this country, which has now found political expression in Donald Trump. It's the more structural, economic and, 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 and security policies that Washington has been promoting, especially since the 1990s, economic uh, liberalization, which has destroyed subsistence farming in these regions, the promotion of mining and other extractive industries, biofuels, which have turned things like the Polichic Valley, which is where many Kekchi live, or the Aguan Valley in Honduras, into into war zones where people are fleeing. This is just it's a it's a it's a it's a it's, a, it's an exodus of, of of biblical proportions. The mayor of the town where Yakalin is from says, in the last couple of months, he's he used the word exodus. He said hundreds of families have left with their children. They can't feed themselves. They, there's no there's no money and there's no food. And you mentioned the border patrol, and yet the the size of the border patrol continues to skyrocket, right? Yeah, yeah. We it used to be from Carter through Reagan, through Bush one and Bush two and Obama and Clinton, the idea was that you would get security first and then have some kind of one-off amnesty. Um, uh, uh, now, uh, and then, I mean, you had Chuck Schumer agreeing that security was the number one issue. I mean, nobody's even talking about an amnesty now, right? I mean, now, now it's just the, the, the bipartisan buy-in to the notion that the border has to be sealed. Is 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 one of the sources of the of 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 the moral crisis in this country. I'd like to end with Ruben Garcia. He's the director of the shelter in El Paso, Texas, where Yaclin's father is now staying. Uh, Garcia read from a statement issued by the attorney for Yaclin's father. The family is seeking an objective and thorough investigation and are asking that investigators will assess this incident within nationally recognized standards for the arrest and custody of children. Jacqueline's father took care of Jacqueline, made sure she was fed and had sufficient water. She and her father sought asylum from Border Patrol as soon as they crossed the border. She had not suffered from a lack of water or food prior to approaching the border. That's Ruben Garcia speaking at the house where uh, Yaclin's father uh, took refuge. Um, we'll continue to follow the story. Clara Long, thanks so much for being with us, senior researcher at Human Rights Watch, and Greg Grandin, prize-winning author and professor of Latin American history at New York University. We'll link to your piece, co-author to Elizabeth Oglesby, uh, Who Killed Yaclin Kalmakin at the U.S. Border? When we come back, 140 children are still separated from their families in U.S. custody. We'll speak with a Harvard psychologist who started a petition demanding the media ramp up coverage of the crisis, like it does when Americans are held hostage overseas. Stay with us.